Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Carl Tart. I'm Jackie's Neil. And I'm Edgar Mobley's here. And we are the host of a new show called Culture Kings on how stuff works. We cover a whole range of topics on this show, but one of the things that we talk about the most is sports because we love them. Jackie's, what's the sports opinion you have? The Cubs are the best team of all time. That's ridiculous. Edgar? Kevin Durant is the greatest player of all time. Nonsense. My favorite basketball player is LeBron James. He's the king of the world. And we'll get into that on Culture Kings. Download it wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere. Just listen to it, damn it. And play a playoff game with a mask. It's gonna take much more than that to get me out of this series. Joel and B stepping out and knocking down a three. The big man is back in a big way. I'm gonna be a nightmare for them too. This is what it's about. This is why you're doing this. This is what all of this is for. We're not here to make friends. We're here to win a series. I can always tell when Chris likes the music because he has a little <laughs> shoulder head bob going right You got to have Those a little bounce to it, Trey. Come on watching now. on uh, ESPN News. The music came on and Chris was like, all right. There we go. Good. Let's there go. There we go. Glad you're it's with like, us. It's like the pregame. You Come know, on. You got to get, get hype. You got to get a little bounce. music. A little swag going. Golden Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News, presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzoil Performance Line. Chris Canny in from my Golic. This hour of Golic and Wingo is brought to you by La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book at LQ.com and win at business. It was funny, we were having this discussion, you mentioned like pregame, uh, golfers at one golf tournament is going to have walk-up music to the first tee. Uh, I like this, that. This is interesting. Do you have, did, did you have one tune that really got you going more than any other one when, when you were getting hyped for games, or did you just go with what whatever was at that time, or was there a go-to tune for you that said, this is what I need? You know what, when Future came out with that song, March Madness, that yeah. was one of my go-tos for pregame warm-up music. It's got the beat. Get a little swag going, you know, do a little dance and as you're getting warmed up. It's just something about that whole thing that gets you ready to play some football. Right. So, I mean, you got to have the right pregame music. If your pregame music is off, you're probably not going to be feeling really good going into that game about your performance. So, I'm just saying you got to make sure the pregame music is right during warm-ups so you can go out there and ball. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because the old thing is if you don't, if you don't look good, you don't feel good, mm-hmm. right? If you have, if your suit's not on point, you know, if you feel like something's on, ah, you're a little off. Yeah. But you're saying that same thing. If your music isn't right, your game can't be right. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's something like All that. Right. It goes hand in hand. You got to look good, but you also got to have your swag right to make sure that you can go out there and be at your best. Okay. So here's the other thing then we're saying. Basically, if you want to sabotage the other team, just, uh, get a, Head a virus on their on their tracks, and then you're good. <laughs> That's right? it. Just hit, hit their <laughs> That's music. It. Hit their music on their on their on their list before the game, and you're done. See, we we learn you things here. There you go. On there you go. Wingo. Glad you're with us. All right, let's get to what's trending, and the Sixers are trending in all the right directions. They beat the Heat 128 108 to take a two one series lead. Joel Embiid. Uh, He's not the hero we deserve right now. He's the hero we embed. I love that Come line. On, I love that good. line. I love that Scored line. Scored 23 points, the most by a 76ers player in his playoff debut since AI in 1999. Well, here's the thing. Joel Embiid is a presence. He's a force out there on the court for the Philadelphia 76ers. And it's not just on the offensive end. It's also on the defensive end. He's that guy that's a rim protector, and so he allows everybody else to be that much more aggressive, knowing that even if somebody's able to get past him, you still got Joel Embiid back there to have your back. So I think it's huge having him back in this series, and you see the 76ers being able to turn it on late in that game, outscoring the Heat 32-14 to in the fourth quarter, and of course Embiid going on a 7-0 run by himself. So good old Joel Embiid being able to come back and get past wearing the mask and get used to it and make that difference for his team. And it's not just offense, it's defense. When he was on the floor, Miami shot 40% from the field. When he was off, they shot 54%. Well, the injuries have been an issue for the Golden State Warriors really all season long with Steph Curry, but little ones with Kevin Durant with the ribs, and now Clay Thompson had the, the fracture of his non-shooting, or on his shooting thumb actually, but Kevin Durant... Says he's fine and will play Sunday after spraining an ankle. He says he won't miss Sunday's game four of their first round series against the Spurs after twisting his left ankle in Thursday night's win. I'm good, he told ESPN's Chris Haynes. It's nothing. Well, it is nothing unless, unless it becomes something. And so I guess the fact that they've already come out and said that he's going to be fine for the next game, I'm not as worried about Kevin Durant. Sean Livingston seems like it's a little more involved. We'll see what happens with that. But as long as this team is whole going into the Western Conference Finals, I think they'll be fine. I think they have enough to get past the Spurs, clearly. But uh, in the next series, when it looks like they're going to be playing the Pelicans, that team will be fine, even if Steph doesn't come back early. I'm just more concerned about making sure this team is healthy going into that Western Conference Finals. 
Well, listen, whatever they're doing now, it's working. They've won 19 of their last 20 playoff games, which ties the record over a 20-game stretch set by the Lakers of 2001 and 2002. So you're right, unless uh, you know a massive food poisoning takes the entire team out somewhere, it looks like they'll be just fine and getting back to where they need. And where we actually, I think a lot of people want to see them against the Rockets in the Western Conference Final. No disrespect to anybody else, but the Rockets had the best record in the regular season. We know what the Warriors are. You want to see the best on the best with everything on the line. Speaking of the best of the best, how about this? If you got an uh, extra two point eight eight million, as I know you do, uh, you can get a Mickey Mantle <laughs> card. You just Mantle go card. put it out there, Trey. Come on, hey, listen. That has to, that has to be the worst thing, by the way, about being a player, because every one of your contracts, you know, oh, you signed for this, 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 this. Yeah. And you're like, guys, really? Come you can on. just it's, look it up right on the internet. Right, it's, it's all, all right, right there. there. Yeah. So anyway, the nineteen fifty two Mickey Mantle tops card in mint condition had the second highest price ever played paid for a baseball card, falling short of the three point one two million which Chris also has, <laughs> uh, for a 1909 T206 Honus Wagner card in October. The Mickey Mantle card was being sold by former NFL offensive lineman Evan Mathis. So there you go. <laughs> so don't tell me you guys don't have – if an old lineman has that kind of cash, <laughs> I know you as a sack guy could have doubled that cash. What did, what did they say? The rich get richer, Trey? That's exactly that's right. Exa- and, like Evan Mathis needs that $2.88 million. That's exactly right. Or he – or. The guy who bought it now is probably going to sell it in five years for three point eight million. There you go. It's the an investment. Go. Interesting we're, investment. We're investing in the future, mm. and we are investing in your future in the NFL by bringing in ESPN NFL insider extraordinaire Dan Graziano. Dan, good to see you, buddy. I wish you'd put your mic on. <laughs> it was on. I, it's on now. Okay. I wish I'd saved my baseball card. Did you have the, any the really, killer really good line ones? I had? The entry line I had here after being late into the studio. This oh, you morning. weren't late. No, when we were doing what's trending. You were fine. See, no one would have known. No, no one would have known. known. Keep like Joel Embiid. Use the mask. Yeah. The mask was working. I don't think it's fair that Sixers got to use Darth Vader. I don't yeah. think that's fair. <laughs> I think the Miami Heat should be upset. Well, we we were trying to, and maybe you'll you can contribute to this. We wanted to name the Embiid Masked Man movie. Uh, uh, we have Invincible, the mm. Emasculator. I love this line. He's mm. not the hero we deserve right now. He's the hero we Embiid. The process of elimination. The nightmare on Broad Street. Silence of the Heat. The process is ready, player one. Oh, I like that one. There's a combination. So yeah. we got a lot out there. All right, there's a lot on your plate right now, obviously, with the schedule being released and everything else that's going on. It doesn't seem, despite the workout videos of Odell Beckham Jr. and Des Bryant together, it doesn't seem like this is going to be a marriage that the Giants want to pull off. Yeah, it would be interesting if, they, if players could get what they wanted just by posting workout videos, right? And, and, that works yeah. in the NBA yeah, look, sometimes. Hey, we're working out together. Put us on the same team. But I don't think that's going to play... In Dave Gettleman's office. I, I don't think you can rule it 100% out, but right now that doesn't seem to be the way the Giants are thinking. Um, it, it, I think from an X's and O's standpoint, it might make a little bit of sense. Mm-hmm. Because Des Bryant at this point, what is he? I, I think he's going to probably be a red zone target, a big yes. body red zone target for somebody. I don't think he's going to go somewhere and be the number one receiver that he used to be. Uh, but I don't think the Giants are ready to bring that in right now. And I, and I think you know they have other issues on their plate, not the least of which is trying to get that Odell contract done. Yeah, I mean, and that's the next question I have for you is when's they're going to get that deal done? Because the thought is Odell has shown them a good faith gesture by showing up on the first day of offseason workouts. Is this something that gets done before week one? And that is a big deal. They wanted him in the building. You know, you can't pressure a guy to be there for voluntary workouts, but they wanted him in there because they want to see him run. He's coming off a major ankle injury. They want to see where he is physically. So it matters that he's there. Um, will it ultimately lead to a deal before training camp, before the start of the regular season? I still think it's too early to say. I don't think those conversations have really progressed anywhere at this point. Um, the Giants have him under contract for this year for a very, very low price, which is the, the, the issue. Uh, and they can franchise him next year if they really want to. The question is, how big a stink is he willing to make about it in the meantime? So uh, at this point, it being mid-April, everyone focused on the draft. I don't think there's been any real progress. That's not to say there can't be this summer. Uh, I think the relationship seems like it's in a little bit better place than it was maybe three, four weeks ago, but a long way to go on that. Dan Graziano with us, our ESPN NFL insider, giving us the Straight Talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. Let's get to that, because you said it may make sense from a football perspective, if they did sign Des Bryant, but because of what we just talked about with Odell, it might not make dollars and cents. Right. Because as much as they like working out together, I'm sure if Des gets a $10 million deal from the Giants, Odell's like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to take care of him before you take care of me? I mean, that seems like that would be 
you said the relationship has come forward. That seems to me like something that would make the relationship take a step back. Yeah, and you know, obviously, I mean, that, that's always on players' minds, right? Everybody knows what everybody's making, as we just, as you guys were just talking about. Um, yeah, I think the question is, what's Des going to get? And I mean, is he going to get ten million dollars a year at this point? If that's true, then I think he's out of the Giants' ballpark. I mean, I was just throwing that number out there. Well, I mean, that's that, that's if an he's going to get if he's going to get what Brandon Marshall was making, then <laughs> yeah. I think it might make more sense, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think Odell Beckham has a problem bringing in a number two wide receiver, number three wide receiver at that price so um ultimately it really comes down to what what contract odell ends up getting and i don't think i mean if, if everyone else on the team's making money it's not going to bother him as long as he gets what he wants so if <laughs> well, if that works it's not going to bother him as long as i get what i want right well, exactly. we can say that about anybody and every <laughs> exactly. right. do whatever you want as long as i get mine so so i think you know if des bryant comes in and he's making whatever he's making and that a the ability of them to sign Odell Beckham, then I think it becomes a problem. But I don't think they're going to make a move that affects their ability to sign Odell Beckham long term. I think that's in that's in one bucket, and the other uh, issues they're dealing with are in are in other buckets. So I don't think that that's necess- that the two are tied together. Dan, you know that Odell Beckham Jr. has been one of the biggest storylines in New York this offseason. But the other big storyline surrounding the Giants is what are they going to do with the second overall pick? A lot of people are saying they're going to go with a quarterback. Saquon Barkley is an option. Will they trade down? What are you hearing right now? Yeah, I, I've heard a, a fair bit of chatter about Bradley Chubb, too, the, the North Carolina State defensive end. As a guy that Dave Gettleman likes, that the people in the Giants building like a lot, would they take him at number two? Would they take him at four or five if they move down into that spot? You know, he's a, he's a name to watch. I mean, I don't think Barkley is, is, I think, the favorite at this point to be their pick at number two. Uh, I personally think they should be thinking quarterback with Eli Manning at 37 years old. I believe but, you put on Twitter they'd be crazy if they Yeah, I think they'd be crazy if they don't take a quarterback. Because how often are you picking number two? And how often are you picking number two in a draft that has quarterbacks at the top that are like this? You don't know. if I mean, down the road, Eli Manning has two, even if he has three years left. Let's say he has three years left, which is what I'm hearing from Giants people. We think he has three years left. If that's the case, you're still going to need someone in three years. Now are you going to be in a position where you have to trade up, make one of these crazy deals with multiple first-round picks? This is an opportunity to, 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 to really help yourself in terms of securing the long-term successor and creating a better situation for yourself at the most important position, and I really think they shouldn't pass it up. But I think they will. Dan Graziano with us in studio, our ESPN NFL insider. It does feel like the Giants sort of hold the linchpin to how the yes. top ten of the draft is going to go because we know – the Browns are going to take a quarterback. We know the Jets traded up to take a quarterback. Uh, you know, and we know that the Browns at four, if he's still there, will probably go Saquon Barkley and have that one too. Or they could also go Bradley Chubb yep. if he's not taken there. But then you have, you know, teams like Buffalo who sits at twelve with two first round picks. You have Arizona who has some capital as well. They have Sam Bradford, but not much. And then the really crazy outlier in all of this would be the New England Patriots. Yes. I mean, Tom Brady is going to be 41. I'm sorry, eventually, and it's way sooner than later, his time will be done. That, that's just the way it's going to be. I mean, right. Adam Schefter has even said, uh, you know, that they're, they haven't got a commitment that he's going to play this year. In fact, let's start there before we get into the draft. Where are you on the Tom Brady will or will not play in 2018? I think he probably will, but I, I, I mean, this is Adam Schefter. I mean, why, Adam's, I mean, by the way, just you got to trust me on this. Adam's information <laughs> this is, is solid. I, it's here, Adam okay? Schefter. I mean, why, why? I mean, there's there's no reason Adam putting something out there if there's nothing behind it. So uh, there's obviously some issue there, and there's obviously some things that have to be worked out between Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. I, I personally think there's there's a chance that those things do get worked out, mm. but they're not there yet. Yeah. And I think, you know, because of that, and, and, and even if there isn't 2018 uncertainty about Tom Brady, like even if you don't want to believe that, there's long-term uncertainty because he's 41 and he's not going to play forever. So I think the Patriots sitting with two first-round picks now are, are in the market for a quarterback. Can they get up high enough to get one of the big four? They have I think two ones and two twos. Yeah, they, they have they the draft capital. Do yeah. it. Yeah. Is that how you want to use your draft right. capital? The Patriots, if they're going to be competitive this year with Tom Brady, are going to need to address the left tackle position. Mm-hmm. That's still something they need to do early in the draft. They've lost two of their three starting tackles because so, uh, Fleming went to Dallas. So you have to. I guess the question is: Is there a quarterback there that's worth mortgaging all those picks for? And if the answer is yes, I wouldn't be surprised to see them make that move. But if the answer is no, then maybe they play in that secondary market and they start thinking about a Lamar Jackson or a Mason Rudolph later in the round. And you might have to move up a little bit to get one of those guys, too, Mm -hmm. from where they're sitting. But I don't think it's crazy to to put the Patriots 
in the quarterback market, especially now that they're sitting there with those two first round picks. Well, see, that would be the most unpatriot thing of all time because normally yes. what do the Patriots do? They they're always a picks, trade down. Yeah, they trade right. down and, and hope they hit on that. But see, this would be a really interesting dynamic if they chose to go down this road because if Brady isn't there yet. And then they use that capital to, to draft his replacement as opposed to stocking yeah. the things around him. It might be a lot longer before we find out what's going on with Brady in 2018, right? But Trey, I got to believe that Tom Brady is coming back. Otherwise, why would Robert Kraft agree to trade Jimmy Garoppolo last year? I think he's got some assurances from Tom Brady that he's going to be around for a couple of years. That only makes sense. You don't have a successor in the building for Tom Brady right now. All that makes sense. But we do know that there is tension there. And yes. we do know that there are issues they there. I believe, the tension, I, believe, I believe the tension is between Tom Brady and Bill Belichick, not Tom Brady and but Robert Kraft. I think Kraft. that has to get worked out. Look, we, the other thing we know about Tom Brady is if he were to walk, he doesn't need this, right? <laughs> if he were to walk away tomorrow, he'd be totally fine, right? Yeah. So it's not, if he decides he doesn't want to play anymore, it's not as if there's going to be some other pull. I, so I think that's... I think I think there are some conversations that need to happen in that Patriots building that haven't happened yet if we're going to get to a place of peace and tranquility for the 2018 Patriots and Tom Brady. Well, let's be clear. Peace and tranquility don't really matter to Bill Belichick. Winning matters to Bill Belichick. But what does it matter to Tom Brady? That's, That's the other thing. I mean, he's, again, he doesn't have to do it. Yeah. So we'll see. Dan Graziano with us. By the way, are we focusing in on the wrong Patriot here? Because it was immediately after the Super Bowl in which – Tight end Rob Gronkowski was asked, hey, I, by a reporter, I, I heard that you were maybe talking about retiring, and I'll never forget his reaction. It wasn't, oh, that's just talk, or I, I don't know where you heard that. He said, where did you hear that? Which led me to believe, yeah, I said that, and I can't believe that you heard it Somebody already. Somebody told you, right. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, because, you know, listen, he's had the back surgeries from everything that we've been able to gather. He hasn't spent any of his NFL money. He's been living off his, uh, he's been living off his endorsements, and he has a very healthy, growing uh, little uh, nest egg in the bank. So, with all this talk about Brady and what Adam is reporting, are we focusing on the, the, the less likely of these to be an issue with Gronk? Yeah, last time I was here, uh, which was the other side of the, 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 the exciting and thrilling Disney cruise I took with my family last week, uh, we were talking about Gronkowski. We weren't talking about Tom Brady, and it was all mm-hmm. issues of Gronk and the Patriots. Now I come back from vacation, it's issues with Brady and the Patriots. So I think there, there's two prongs there, and I think, you know, Gronkowski is certainly not a resolved issue yet either. I still think something has to happen with his contract to make him happy. I agree yeah. with that, Dan. I think it's a combination of the different factors, the tension with Bill Belichick, because it's clear that Rob Gronkowski is in that Tom Brady camp and how everything went down with Alex Guerrero yeah. and TB12. I feel like all of that tension is starting to build, and Gronkowski is saying, okay, listen, I'm willing to continue to play, but I want to be compensated like a number one receiving option and not just as the highest paid tight end or one of the highest paid tight ends in the NFL. And remember last year they loaded up his contract with some incentives that were specific to last year, and, and now that those aren't in this year's contract. He's still You look at his number, it's much lower than, than where it should be relative to his production as a top tight end. Uh, so I, I still think that they could make him happy with doing something with the contract. Okay, so that's Gronk and that's Brady. Uh, and then there's the issue of what we're talking about with uh, Saquon Barkley. Um, do we really believe, when push comes to shove, we've talked about the second overall pick for the Giants. I know you believe they should go quarterback. Mm-hmm. But right now, if they're turning in that card, do you think it'll be Chubb or, or Barkley? If I had to bet, yeah. and I don't. You do, because I, I we're don't betting bet. a dollar. I don't bet. Oh, We're betting a whole dollar. Making me Trading bet. places, one dollar. <laughs> if I had to bet, I'd bet Barkley. Barkley. But I'm not ruling out Chubb. <laughs> but if I had to bet, that's not saying yeah. much, Trey. What? No, I mean, if I, you tell me, here's my dollar. It's on Barkley, but it's not an easy decision for me to do that. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll say this: yeah. if they stay at two, if they don't trade okay, out, maybe of the that's pick, maybe that's a better question. Yeah. If they don't trade out of the pick. Yeah. I believe they'll take Saquon. Barkley. Maybe that's a better question, Chris. You can weigh in this because you know yeah. this in the organization as well. What's the likelihood? What's more likely that they stay at two or that they move out of two? I'll let you take the first swing at that. I think they'll probably move out of two. If their quarterback that they want is not there, they'll probably move out of two. And you believe they want one quarterback. I think they want one quarterback, and they don't want to have to relive that name, decade. His name rhymes with Pam Parnold. <laughs> I, I'm just assuming right? Sam, I'm assuming Sam Donald just because he has the highest floor. I, I don't know that to be a fact, but I do know that they like one quarterback, and the Giants organization is not interested in reliving that decade between Phil Sims and Eli Manning. So they want to stabilize the franchise. I have a hard time seeing how they do that without securing the successor for Eli Manning. That I'm just makes you. sense. We're on the same page. I just don't know if Dave Gettleman is. And if he is, 
And he's doing a real good job trying to convince everybody he's not because everything he's saying is indicating uh, that he doesn't have to go quarterback. And here's why I want to agree with you. When have we seen a general manager reveal his uh, plan to draft a running back season. for months before the draft? It's, it's, Dave Gettleman has been openly gushing about Saquon Barkley. I, I'd have to assume that he's not telling us the prospect that but, he really likes. But remember, he was GM of the Panthers last year, and we knew at this point that they were going with Christian McCaffrey. Like that was that was a, that was an open secret at that point, so it wouldn't be the first time uh, that that he had telegraphed his intentions. So, do you think they'll stay or will they move out of that summer two? I think pick? they'll move because I think they're going to get an offer that's too good to pass up from one of those teams going up to get a quarterback. Yeah, let's say Buffalo. Buffalo. Sure. And again, the irony there is the Jets move from six to three mm-hmm. to get a quarterback, and they have to believe that there's more than one that they like because of what may or may not be there. And the buff they did that to get ahead of Buffalo. Yeah. And Buffalo may now get ahead of them thanks to the Jets' uh, city counterpart, the Giants. That's the fascinating <laughs> thing about all this. Six days to go, exactly. baby. Exactly. With, with, with all that's said and done, the team that they share a stadium with may be the one that just goes, whoop, no thank you. And they'll <laughs> give that opponent to one of the teams in their division. It is going to be a fascinating thing. We can't wait. Again, Golik and Wingo will be there for the draft Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I'll be hosting the draft Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Will be a lot of fun. Chris Canny will be hosting the draft on ESPN Radio, and we'll make. Oh, this is the best question we need yeah. to ask you. He's going to make the Giants' third round pick. Yeah, in Dallas. How much should he troll the Cowboys as a former Cowboy second round draft pick? Much in the same way Drew Pearson yeah, trolled Pearson the entire really city. Really set the bar. He, he set the bar pretty high. You don't, you got to be careful because you don't want to look like you're just trying to copy. Yeah, right? no, I don't want to copy. Yeah, but here's yeah, the thing. There's it only all, one it, Chris Canty. There's only one. Plus, that's another one of your teams. That, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It all depends on the reception that the Dallas fans give me. I think you got because be if I if, friendly if I get a, radio, Chris Kent. Yeah, because if it's a warm yeah. reception, I can't troll them. Yeah, but if yeah. they do, I can always drop the mic with the Super Bowl ring. You could, yeah. you could. I, I I I have a feeling. That the, it'll be a mixed reception. Oh, I remember that guy, Chris Canny. But then you're starting for the Giants. You're like, well, he's not one of us. <laughs> he's not one of us anymore. But the Giants gave you, what, 40-something million reasons. To Boy, he's really reasons. focused on your contract, to, isn't he? He really put, likes talking about your contract. Get out of my pockets, Trey. I, I get out of my pockets, Trey. I just need a little loan. Help me out. All right, Dan, <laughs> thank you. Mickey we Mantle appreciate card. that. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'll get it from Evan Mathis when I get yeah. his $2.88 million. Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golik look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yep, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Cake by the ocean. Golgan Wingo, ESPN Radio and ESPN News. Devin and Cliff are very happy in the in the booth. Don't know what happened there, but all right. We are presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Trey Wingo here. Chris Canny in from Mike Golick from 98.7 uh, ESPN Radio in New York. And that was one of your callers from the Humpty and Candy show. Yeah, right? that's Tony from Akron. Yeah. Okay. So what we don't, what people, so this is, she's the reason, by the way, that, that Rick was very mad at us. Yeah. You know, Rick DiPietro, he still has a little beef with Too you. Too much and, vulcanized rubber to the head. That's all I say. <laughs> and Dave Rothenberg didn't feel great about it either. That's our other co-host. But listen, Tony didn't give Credit where credit was due. She should have told you guys that, that, that was, she that got that from line. Rick DiPietro. Yeah. yeah, no idea. She called in and said he's a feisty little nugget, and we ran with that. In fact, when we had him on the draft, his uh, his name on the screen will not be Adam Schefter at Adam Schefter. It'll be Adam Schefter, hashtag feisty little nugget. Feisty little nugget. That's got what it. we're doing there. But the last story in Sports Center was about the Cavaliers taking on the Pacers tonight in Game 3, and Brian Windhorst just posted a very interesting article on ESPN.com. You can check it out. And the question is... Is this supporting cast for LeBron James the worst supporting cast he's had in any playoff run? And immediately your mind goes back to 2007 when they made their first trip to the finals and they were swept, I think, by the Spurs uh, there. And that was really 
LeBron James and uh, LeBron James and others. Yes, you know, but but it's an interesting discussion from Wendy because first of all, this is a, a a group that hasn't been together very long. Really, most of them just since the since the trade deadline. But it is uh, one of the least expensive supporting casts for sure. The question then become: the Cavs uh, have the oldest and most expensive roster in the playoffs, and James has had the heavy lifting. So, uh, you know, wh- where do we see these other points coming from for LeBron's team? Because they're not going to survive. They're not going to survive if it's just LeBron and, oh, by the way, everyone else getting 15, 12, 6, 6, and 2. Well, first of all, it has to start with Kevin Love, the other all-star. Now, I know he's got the, the ligament and the thumb issue, but, but it's he's, he's going to be him. okay. He's going to be out there. He's got to be better. Rodney Hood has definitely got to be better. You know, you bought him in to be one of those spot-up shooters, a perimeter scorer, that kind of guy. He hasn't necessarily filled that role that they thought he would. J.R. Smith, we know he can be streaky and he can be hot, but when he's cold, he's ice cold, and so... Those are the guys that are really going to have to carry the load in terms of being better offensively. But where I worry about this Cavs team is defensively. Yeah. You got these guys at the trade deadline because they were younger and more athletic. You thought that you would improve defensively, and that hasn't necessarily been the case. So that's put a lot more on LeBron James right now. And this is the first time we've seen him in a long time struggle in the first round of a playoff series. Well, the interesting thing there is the defense has been the one thing that's been kind of okay during the first two games of the playoffs. They've held Indiana to under 100 points in each of those games. But you're right, that was a huge problem for them in the regular season. But as Wendy points out in this article, and it's a really interesting article because I think most people say clearly 2007 was the worst team he had around him, and that might be the case eventually. But the five leading scorers in the regular season after LeBron are Kevin Love, Kyle Korver, Jordan Clarkson, Jeff Green, and Rodney Hood. They are a combined 22 of 68 shooting so far in the first two games. So James has basically scored or assisted on 62% of his team's buckets. Now, if that would hold out, that would be the highest number of his playoff career per ESPN stats and information. His current high was back in 2009 at 54%. So, again, this goes back to the MVP argument we've had before. For example, the Rockets won the other night by 20 when James Harden went 2 of 18. Yeah. If LeBron James has a 2 of 18 shooting performance... Uh, the Cavs won't win by 20. They'll lose by 40. Yeah, and we saw that in Game 1 when he got off to that slow start. I don't think he took his first shot until less than two minutes left in and the first quarter. And still had a triple-double. And still had a triple-double. But you saw that Ty Lue and LeBron James were on the same page and wanting him to get off to a fast start offensively in Game 2. So I'm going to say it's going to take another effort like that for LeBron James to be able to move past this Indiana Pacers team in Game 3. It's going to have to look like that, but the supporting cast is going to have to pull their weight on the offensive end. you got to get more production from guys like Rodney Hood and Jordan Clarkson Clarkson and George Hill. Those guys have got to be better. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Chris Canty is a radio professional. Because that leads us seamlessly into... Over, under, with Golik and Wingo. By the way, it is a really interesting article by Wendy on ESPN.com. You should check it out because the stats are overwhelming. So let's start over, under at 29 and a half. Points for LeBron James tonight in Game 3 against the Pacers. Again, he's averaging 35 points through the first two games. I'm going over. I'm going over because it has to be over. Even when it may you look have to at be the way four, over. Even when you look at the 46-point game he had in Game 2, the Pacers still had an opportunity with less than a minute to go. Victor Oladipo misses a wide-open three. So when you start looking at how that sequence of events happened in the last minute, you have to think to yourself, okay, LeBron James has to do this just to make sure that his team has a chance of being able to win because you saw what the Pacers did to the Cavs in Game 1. It was a blowout win for them. Yeah, 24 points for LeBron in Game 1, 46 points in Game 2. Uh, what is this? He's 33 years old, right? That's he's 33. I'm going to say the over under really needs to be 33 yeah. <laughs> at least. So I'm going to take the over on 29 and a half. And I think it's going to be somewhere in the 33 to 38 range if they're going to have any chance at winning this game. Over under brought to you by Grasshopper, the entrepreneur's phone system. I've always wanted to be entrepreneurial. <laughs> Run your business from your mobile phone. See how it works at grasshopper.com. Okay. We continue on over under. One and a half losses for the Warriors before the Western Conference Finals. I'm going under. I'm going under. It feels like it has to be. Yeah, I don't think this team is going to lose. And even though they're going to match up against a tough Pelicans team in the second round, just the lack of experience, I think, is going to hurt them in that series going up against 
the Golden State Warriors. And so with Kevin Durant and Klay Thompson out there, they can pick their poison. Those two guys can be able to get their shot anytime they want. And Golden State is just so much better defensively than every other team that they're going up against, including the Pelicans. So I like Golden State. I don't think that they're going to lose a game until they get to the Western Conference Finals. Yeah, it certainly doesn't seem like the Spurs are going to offer them much resistance. And again, they're one game away from sweeping that. So the question then becomes, are the Pelicans going to win one or two games? Uh I guess it's possible that Anthony Davis could go bonkers in a couple of games and they could go that way, but no. Nah, and Drew Holiday's going to have to do what he did the other night if that's going to continue yeah. uh, and get a couple of games off, off Golden State. So I'm going to go under as well. I think at, at the most they'll lose one game before what we're thinking is going to be a potential Western Conference Finals matchup with Houston. Okay, Baker Mayfield said in a SI.com MMQB article, he took a look at a paper and drew a line underneath the number five selection in the draft, which is held by the Broncos, and said, I'm not going later than this. So over under the fifth pick where Baker Mayfield will be drafted next Thursday. I'm going to go under, and I know that there are a lot of teams that are trying to move up in that top five to position themselves to get a quarterback, but I really do believe it's about the big three, and that's Josh Rosen, Josh Allen, and Sam Donald in that territory. I don't think Baker Mayfield will slide past the top half of the first round. I've got the Miami Dolphins at 11 circled. They've been a team that's shown a lot of interest in Baker Mayfield in the pre-draft process, and they're not sold on Ryan Tellehill being their future franchise quarterback. And, of course, he's coming off injury. So I I like the idea of Baker Mayfield going into that Miami Dolphins organization and completely changing the culture. We're just seeing if Adam Gase is on the same page that I am. So you're saying that he think you think he goes to Miami, but you think he goes to Miami because they move up. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean Miami might. I'm saying I don't think Baker Mayfield is going to go in the top five. So okay, so I don't think he's going in the top five. So you're taking. You're I'm taking, taking the on. The over, right? the over, the I'm taking yeah, the yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. So you, I was confused. I'm a little bit confused. A little I was bit. like, I, I, I get what you're going, but I'm not sure what you're actually saying there. No, I think he's gonna, <laughs> he's not gonna go that high. Okay. The interesting thing there is because once you get past these teams, uh, you know, obviously you have the Browns at four, and then you have the Broncos at five, and then you know six through ten, there's really not a huge need for quarterback there. So if somehow he doesn't uh, go by the top five it's conceivable that Miami could still get him at number 11. So let's just say, for whatever reason it goes, Josh Allen, number one, mm-hmm. Sam Darnold, number two, uh, Josh Rosen, number three, uh, Saquon Barkley, number four, and then at number five, Bradley Chubb, if they go decide to go Bradley Chubb to pair against Von Miller, which, by the way, I think would be a really smart thing to do. <laughs> just throwing it out there, Denver. Case Keenum is a pretty good option right now at quarterback for you. And then you have your bookends like you had with DeMarcus Ware, a guy you were drafted with with the Cowboys mm-hmm. in 2005 on one end, and Von Miller on the other side. Suddenly that defense is going to be very, very interesting for people. So if that happens, I think it's very conceivable that Miami wouldn't even have to move up from number 11. So I think I'm going to take the over there as well. I think there I'm we with you. I, I think if, if those two spots go the way they are, uh, I think that we might see Baker Mayfield sitting there past past the five spot and maybe getting to his 11 because once you get six through 10, those teams are really not quarterback needy, right? No, now. they're not quarterback needy, but it would be interesting to see if some of those other teams like Arizona and like Buffalo are trying to move up in front of a team like right. Miami with one of those teams that doesn't need a quarterback in those six through 10 picks. And and again, the whole thing, which I think is hilarious, is that it's, it's really up to the Giants on what they want to do and whether or not – they can stick the knife in the Jets who moved up from 6-3 to three and maybe upset the entire apple cart. All right, coming up, we'll do more of these later. When does the owner of the Browns deserve to know who the team's GM is going to be taking with number one? That's an excellent question because deserve is so rarely a part of any equation in football. Every deck is made for standing on, but there's only one that's always had a way of standing out. So if you're looking to bring more style, comfort, and creativity to your life outdoors... Call on the brand that's known for making the most in outdoor living. From decking, railing, and lighting to furniture, fencing, and framing. At Trex, we're engineering what's next in outdoor living. To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer, call 1-800-289-TREX or visit trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. I like those horns, man. I want big sound. I get this. And, And they get this.
Golik and Wingo reminding you that we'll be live next Thursday and Friday from Arlington, Texas for the NFL Draft, brought to you by La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book at LQ.com and win at business. Trey Wingo here. Chris Canny in from ESPN New York 98.7, as Mike is off today, um, talking about a little over-under that we were playing, and we stopped on Baker Mayfield, and during the break we had an extended dance mix discussion on Baker Mayfield, (laughs) which I really like. So before we get to the finish of over-under, let's continue this discussion with Baker. Because if he doesn't go in the top five, here are the teams six through ten. The Colts, probably not going to be taking a quarterback. The Bucks probably not be taking a quarterback. Uh, the Bears, definitely not taking a quarterback. Yep. The Niners, definitively not taking a quarterback. The Raiders at ten, absolutely not taking a quarterback. And that leaves you to Miami. So Miami sits there at 11, and Buffalo is at 12. Then, if uh, if if... Baker doesn't go through the top five, then you have maybe the, the jostling between 11 and 12, whether it's Miami or Buffalo trying to move up but with the 6 through 10 guys and get the quarterback. Mm-hmm. But the interesting thing here about Baker is that, look, obviously he's a very competitive guy. Uh, his teammates at Oklahoma love him, and he's been very productive. But I think there are a couple of things that are going to be real question marks at the next level. First of all, you can't get around his size. No, He's barely 6 feet tall. The only two quarterbacks that I know that have been very successful – I think Michael Vick was six two or six one. He was he was he was not as short as Baker. He's a, is. Yeah, he's plus another, he was yeah. a freakish athlete. Well, he okay? ran like a four three forty. So it, it, exactly. So yeah. let's exclude him. Uh, then there's Drew Brees and Russell Wilson. So if you're Russell, if you're uh, Baker's size, you essentially have to have the escapability and the imagination of Russell Wilson. Well, here's the problem. There, Baker ran a four eight and a four nine forty. Russell ran a four five. What did you run in your forty? Well, I ran a four eight one. Okay. So that just goes to show you a little bit of context what NFL defensive linemen and, and edge pass rushers are doing. Von Miller runs like a four five. So right. Baker Mayfield's not outrunning any of those guys to the edge of the defense. Yeah. And so when I think about Baker Mayfield and trying to project him and what he's going to do at the pro level, I always go back to something that Bill Parcell said: If you don't remind me of somebody that I've had success with, then I'm probably not going to draft you. Baker Mayfield doesn't remind me of a lot of NFL quarterbacks that have had success with that stature and skill set in the, at this level. So I'm a little bit worried about what he's going to be capable of doing and how whatever team drafts him plans on using him because his skill set is very unique and you have to have a plan. And I don't know that Baker Mayfield is necessarily going to be that guy that's going to be able to take over a franchise and have the success in terms of production. Okay, so I think we can establish he's not fast enough to get away from the best pass rushers in the NFL. Yeah. So that eliminates the Russell Wilson comparison. Then the question becomes Drew Brees. He's fantastic. He's six one, I think, just over six feet, uh, and he's been phenomenal. There have been nine 5,000 passing yard seasons in NFL history. Drew has over half of them. He has five. So are we going to believe then that Baker Mayfield can be Drew Brees? I mean, we got to play the odds, Trey. How many Drew Breeses have we seen? It's Not only many. one Drew Brees. So, I mean, when you start talking about comparing him to those type of athletes, I don't think that's that's fair to assume that Baker Mayfield is going to be able to have the same level of success. So Baker's Baker Mayfield's game has been so much about – being able to use his legs to extend plays in college, and he's played in a spread system, really like a run-and-shoot type of system, I don't know that Baker Mayfield can consistently win from the pocket, especially at his stature, because it's going to be a different game when he gets to the NFL level. And if you don't have a quarterback that can consistently win from the pocket and he doesn't have the athleticism and the escapability to get away from those defensive linemen, he's going to be in a world of hurt. Yeah, and look, the offense, the, the offense that Oklahoma ran wasn't really a, a pure spread. It was a little more based on a couple of other things, but you're right. It's not the same kind of offense he'll be asked to run in the NFL. So if he's not going to be Drew Brees and he doesn't have the escapability of a guy like Russell Wilson, those are two things that as a quarterback in smaller stature, they're going to be a problem. And one of the things that people always say they love about Baker, oh, his competitive spirit, his competitive fire, his teammates love him. They get him fired up. Well, it's easy. To be fired up by that kind of behavior when everyone else on your team is 19 to 21 years old. <laughs> uh, let's say, uh, how old were you when you were playing your last three seasons with the Ravens? Uh, I was 33 years old. Okay, you're yeah. 33 years old, you've made some money, you've got some things you got to take care of, and you have a 22-year-old kid coming in fire and brimstone, screaming, let's go, all that kind of stuff. 
How will that play in the locker room? Guys really don't care about that whole fiery, let's go, let's try to rah rah. They don't want that. What they want is somebody that's going to show up, be a professional, and do their job. And as the quarterback, you've got to be the first person in the building and the last person to leave. I know it sounds cliche, but that's it's what, true. But that's what the players on the team and in the locker room want to see because so much of their livelihood and their success depends on what you do as the quarterback. It's the most important position in team sports. And so, with Baker Mayfield, there have been some questions about his character and how he's going to adjust to the pro game. And is he going to be that consummate professional when he gets to whatever NFL city that drafts him? So I think there's a little bit of concern from players from that standpoint if you have to deal with a guy that's like that. Yeah, again, his teammates love him because they're all the same age. They they're all college, buy that They're college stuff. kids. They're college kids. That rah, rah Unless you play like Drew Brees. That rah rah stuff won't work at the yeah. NFL level. I mean, remember when Jameis Winston put his fingers together? And oh yeah, we're going to eat, gonna that eat w? a W. Yeah. I swear to you, some of his teammates are like, "Dude, what are you doing? Yeah, literally, what are you saying to me right now? I don't care about any of this. Eat the W. Can you make enough plays for us to win this game? It. So they looked at him like he had four arms yeah. when he was going. <laughs> if he had done That's that, not what you want to like, see from your quarterback. Yeah, How about we get ready plays. to go play and win a football game? One of the That's things I, lo- I love about Derek Carr when they had that two-game road swing a couple years ago in Florida, he says, guys, all I can promise you, I'm going to give you everything I got. All I ask is you give me everything in return. That's the kind of rah-rah stuff you want to hear from your quarterback at the next level. All right, we'll be in Dallas next week for the draft. we got a member of the Cowboys Ring of Honor in here next, and we'll finish up over-under as well. Stay with us. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance, so he switched and saved. So, it was all... Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Carl Tart. I'm Jackie's Neil. And I'm Edgar Mobley's here. And we are the host of a new show called Culture Kings on how stuff works. We cover a whole range of topics on this show, but one of the things that we talk about the most is sports because we love them. Jackie's, what's the sports opinion you have? The Cubs are the best team of all time. That's ridiculous. Edgar? Kevin Durant is the greatest player of all time. Nonsense. My favorite basketball player is LeBron James. He's the king of the world. And we'll get into that on Culture Kings. Download it wherever you get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere. Just listen to it, damn it. Golgan Wingo with you on ESPN Radio and ESPN News, presented by Progressive Insurance. Phone guests join us on the Shell Penzoil performance line. That was RNO uh, out of New Orleans uh, in that WRNO uh, with our sports uh, update right there. So glad you're with us. And be sure to check out our great pitching matchup tonight as Max Scherzer and the Nats take on Clayton Kershaw and the Dodgers. Game starts at 10 p.m. Eastern on the new ESPN+. Plus. A lot of strikeouts in that game. They, well, that, that is, <laughs> if you're taking an over-under, which we're going to finish, you would take the, the over on those strikeouts at about no uh, doubt 10, about more it. than likely. Uh, glad you're with us, and uh, we're glad to be joined by Darren Woodson, our ESPN NFL analyst in studio, giving us the straight talk, brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless, best phones, best networks, no contracts. And i got to give you a little straight talk when it comes to Darren Woodson. Darren and I were doing the uh, s- uh, schedule release show, the Sports Center Special last night, nineteen ten. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and right around nine thirty, Darren looks at his phone and says, "Oh, I got to get up and do radio in the morning." He goes, "Wingo." He calls me his sensei. He says, "Sensei, sensei, <laughs> sensei. <laughs> you don't you don't need me tomorrow morning." Uh, I said, "Dude, you're showing up at nine. <laughs> I did the show this morning. Uh, let- we got off the air at ten. I'm going to be in five hours <laughs> before you." Man, get your butt in the studio at nine o'clock. I, I can yeah, tell yeah. you this: yeah. I slept really good. Oh, uh-huh. you're such a yeah. jerk! I mean, I, man, I woke up about four o'clock. I just rolled over and then we went right back. Oh, to he's sleep. such wow. a jerk! Wow. Man. He's you, my you, guy. You don't really right go here. there, especially like, when this guy was getting up at four hey, o'clock. Man, trust me, oh. now, he's it, he goes in on me. He goes in <laughs> on me. He goes in on me. So I'm, I'm going to take this one today, man. So how this do you get the nickname Sensei? Uh, he would. You know how you when you when you started playing in the league. When you first came in the league and you didn't know where to line up, yeah, and you had that guy who said, "Okay, look, man, you're supposed to be in a three technique. This is what a three technique actually looks like, right? Yeah. Put you right in the spot where you need to be." Uh, when I came in about ten years ago, line me up, really. All I mean, don't do this, do that. Don't go here, go there. 
Uh, what time you need to get to the airport? Let me show you the route. I mean, actually drove me. He led me yeah, to the that. airport. There you go. I mean, there were so many things that he did for me early on. So I said, hey, man, this is. That's what I call a good teammate right a there. A great teammate. There That's why I call That's him the sensei right there. Yeah. Tell you, my, my great homie. story. Uh, his, <laughs> his first day here, his first day, Darren's first day at ESPN, he was just supposed to be, you know, shadowing, watching, all this kind of stuff. His very first day here, Jerry Rice announced his retirement. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So the Cowboys and Niners of the nineties, that was the rivalry. Every year Cowboys Niners NFC championship game was the Super Bowl. Yeah. So they said, Hey Darren, we need you to come on. And he was fine and did all that stuff his first day. But then we have these things that they used to call instant analysis. Oh, God. Where you look into the camera as an analyst and you just go for thirty seconds on something. <laughs> it is literally the hardest thing to do for anybody that's never done television before. Because you just they, there's no timer that nobody asks you a question. You just look in the camera and say, talk about Jerry Rice. Well, you know, Jerry Rice was a very difficult guy for me to cover. Did all this, blah, 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 blah. It's a hard thing to do, yeah. man, because once you get starting talking, sometimes you don't know where to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like the word salad comes out. And I swear, Darren is – the fact that he still hears him, it, they went through 37 it takes. takes. Yeah. And I'm and there after there. everyone. All right, man, just try this, do that. <laughs> try this, do that. That's why he said say, man, to coach me up through this thing. But I'll I tell you what, on that 37th take, that was the best damn instant analysis I ever saw in Jerry Rice's career. So Darren and I go way back. Every yeah. rook needs a vet. Yeah, Every rookie needs Absolutely. a vet. Absolutely. No we're, we're glad you're here with us. We're going to finish up over under, but we were just having this discussion about Baker Mayfield. And your Cowboys locker room, you know, they had all kinds of characters in that place, and they didn't put up with anything from anybody. I mean, that you got leveled if you weren't if you weren't doing the things you needed to be doing Absolutely. in that locker room. Yeah, I mean, have they, some alpha dog. That, that's yeah. exactly yeah. right. So we were just having this discussion with Baker, and everybody says from the college, "Oh, his teammates love him." The, the rah rah atmosphere, all that kind of stuff, he gets in their faces. And I've always been like, "That's because they're eighteen to nineteen to twenty years right. old." Is that stuff going to play? In your Cowboys locker room, I asked Chris and his Cowboys or his his Ravens locker room, and he's like, no, man, just go out there and make plays. I don't want to hear any of that garbage. Yeah, exactly. I, I think this is the case. When you come into the NFL locker room, the one thing they want to see is commitment, How, especially at that position. Yeah. If you're committed at that position, the quarterback position, which is a natural leadership position, if you're in there early, willing to work, guys will see that. The guys in that quarterback room are going to see that. The running backs are going to see that. The O line, who's the one you definitely need to show that you're committed. Once you they once you can prove that that you're committed to being there and winning football games, then the rest takes care of itself. But all this stuff that he's going through right now, all the rah rah stuff, and you know everybody in, in college loves him. Yeah, they, they love him because they lose one game through the, through the season at OU. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And the NFL doesn't work that way. No, not and at all. You're going to lose games as a quarterback. You're going to lose games, uh, even as a ba- you know as a backup as a quarterback. You're all going to lose games, but at the same time, if they could consistently show that you are working for the betterment of the football team, yes, guys will rally behind you. And I've played with guys like this. I've played. You know, look, I I used to see Troy Aikman walk in at 6 a.m. every day with his lunch pail. Yeah, and he was a you know they always say be the first one to leave, uh, first one in, last one to leave. He brought his lunch pail to work every day. Yeah. This is what this is what I knew about him. So a guy like Baker Mayfield, he's got to re, he's going to have to earn that respect. All that stuff from he's the done in college doesn't matter. Doesn't anymore. matter. No, it's over. Doesn't with. matter. It's, it starts all over. He gets drafted. It starts all over again. And, and that's why I think the biggest thing. Forget the the planting of the flag at Ohio State. I was that yeah. didn't bother me. And yeah, maybe the Kansas thing not shaking his hand. The Oklahoma uh, they started that. Yeah, that didn't mean he didn't have to have his reaction on the sideline. But but they poked the bear there. My biggest thing is when he says, when he goes to the Chargers, yeah, I didn't really study their playbook because I was prioritizing other playbooks and I've got a lot on my plate. The only thing you have on your plate right now is a job audition. Exactly. That's yeah. it. Hey, Nothing it, else matters. You know, That's it. The biggest problem I had with what he said was that he had diarrhea of the mouth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just, say, uh, just say, I, I just didn't study up. That's my bad. You know, and, and it's a, there's something to be said about the guys that, you know, hey, look, is, is is Peyton Manning the guy that we all believe that he is? Like he's just a you know the a true role model, or Tom Brady is he just that guy that you always think? Oh my God, he's the all American guy. No, they're not. But the perception and the professionalism that they carry themselves off the field with it allows them to get away with certain things. That's yeah. it. And they, they say the right things. I'm not the best guy all the time, even though I think I am. <laughs> yeah. But at least you know I'll try to say the right things, and I might believe something totally different. But just the perception of what people, how they look at you means a lot. And I'm, I'm telling you, the quarterback position more than any position, there's, you have to have the respect 
by not only not only your teammates but the media as well. Yeah, when we were talking about the Jameis Winston thing last year, we tried to eat the W, and some of his oh, teammates yeah. were looking at him like, "Dude, Come what on, in man. the hell are you talking about?" You know, I had a guy yeah. I played with, man. I mean, love him to death. The guy's name was Quincy Carter. Quincy mm-hmm. Carter was a guy that you, you you I saw what Troy Aikman was and how he was the model quarterback and how he handled himself on and off the field. Quincy Carter came in, and Quincy, you know, he had his struggles. Off the field was where his, his the, the perception of what he was doing off the field, the things like you know hanging out with the wrong people, staying out late at the club. When you're a quarterback, you just can't can't be that guy. It. You can't run with everybody. It just doesn't yeah. work that way. Well, yeah. perception is reality. That's exactly. what it comes down to, right? And Bill Parcells has one of those stories out there where he told Phil Sims, "Lock yourself in the quarterback's room, and you, you're perceived by your teammates as studying tape. Exactly. It doesn't matter if you're sleeping or doing whatever, exactly. but just be in the room and be in the building because the guys want to see that commitment from your quarterback because all those guys depend on you to feed their family. Yeah, yeah. That, that's <laughs> exactly. the whole thing. Look, and the other thing about it, too, as as we're looking at this with Baker, what did Bill Parcells always say? Don't be a celebrity quarterback. He yep. had his rules. Number 11 was don't be a celebrity quarterback. And you know, people are, well, Tom Brady does endorsements. Uh, Peyton Manning does endorsements. They've earned it. Exactly. Okay, they've yeah, earned so it. True. There's a difference there. So you got to come in humble and hungry, man. Otherwise, it, it tends to go poorly for you. I mean, so look, the Baker thing is interesting. There's no question he's got talent. But at the end of the day, what's going what's gonna to sway? Is it going right. to be the other stuff or is it going to be this stuff? Um, and that's why I wanted to get your talk on this. All right, let's finish up a couple of these over-unders, and then we'll get into more stuff with, with Darren here. Uh, let's talk about another quarterback in the draft, Lamar Jackson. Where will he dra- be drafted next week? We have the over-under at 23. Both Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay have him rated as the fifth best quarterback available in this draft. 23 means he'd get past all the uh, quarterback needy teams like uh, Buffalo at 12, Arizona at 15. But then you get into the area where the New Orleans Saints may be looking for an heir yeah. apparent. By the way, that to me, that would be the absolute perfect spot for him to go and learn under Drew, Drew Brees and Sean Payton for a couple of years. Over, under at 23rd overall pick. Over or under? I'm going to go over. I'm going to say he slides a little bit. He still gets drafted in the first round, but I think you missed that first wave of those quarterbacks. You're talking about Baker Mayfield, Josh Rosen, Josh Allen, Sam Donald going in the top half of the first round. I think he slides, but a team that's looking for a successor to a veteran quarterback would probably think about Lamar Jackson in that late 20s, early 30s range. I think that's exactly where he's going to be drafted. And again, Bills have the 22nd overall pick as well as the 12th, and the Patriots have the 23rd. And the so, Patriots have shown a lot of interest yeah. in Lamar Jackson in the pre-draft process. Yeah, I agree. I, I think he slides a little bit, but he's going to go to a team that's not, you know, listen, that, I think he goes to a team like a, a, hopefully a New Orleans Saints or New England Patriots where he can learn under some of the, the tutelage of great coaches. I think this guy slides a little bit, but you know, the, the talk about him playing different positions and being this, you know, versatile guy, he's a quarterback. This is yeah. what he's done all his life. I want to, the, the talk about all this other stuff. The guy plays the quarterback position. If he can learn from some of the best, he will be, he will have a long career in the NFL. I'm fascinated by what he's going to do because the skill set is there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, he has everything you would want. The question is, will he be, look, as Lewis Riddick aptly puts it, who's coaching him? You know, this is always about who's coaching him. Yeah. I think Jacoby Brissett, benefited greatly from having a couple of years under Bill Belichick, yeah. and he's, he's turning out to be a decent quarterback for the Indianapolis Colts and a great guy should the Andrew Luck thing once again be a problem. He's a guy that they can count on to, to get them through some games. So where Lamar Jackson goes is as, who he's with is as much as important as where he goes in the NFL draft. And then we'll do one more here before we get to other stuff with you, Darren. Uh, over under on Wednesday night when the Browns GM John Dorsey should tell Browns owner Jimmy Haslam who he plans to take number one overall. According to Chris Sims of the Bleacher Report, Dorsey is keeping his intentions for the number one pick a secret from anyone and everyone, including the owner Jimmy Haslam, mm. until Wednesday night. So <laughs> I'm not buying it. I'm saying under Jimmy Haslam will have an idea of what John Dorsey is going to do with that number one overall pick because he's the guy that's signing the check. So right. ultimately, he's got to sign off on whoever they're going to make the future face of this franchise. And that's what we're planning on the Cleveland Browns doing. We're thinking that they're going to take a quarterback. They're going to need a quarterback. I love Tyrod Taylor, but they need somebody that has a little more upside than he does. So I'm going to say that Jimmy Haslam knows Who's going to be that number one pick before Wednesday night? Trust me. That's the under. I'm with you on that. The owner doesn't know. You're going to hide this from me? Look, I own my own business. (laughs) I'm a business owner right now. And someone's going to hide that information from me? Please. It's not going to work that way. Jimmy Haslam probably knows already. He's probably been in those meetings. John Dorsey coming in as a new GM. He's going to owe that to the owner to to know exactly which direction he's going. And 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 listen, I I think this is this sets perfectly up for uh, for John Dorsey. If he makes the right pick, 
if he go if he makes the right pick in this draft and this team it turns this franchise around one he and go four. down let's go. he's got a couple yeah, yeah. Uh, but the interesting thing there is you know Jerry Jones wouldn't let that fool. No, it's not happening. It would be really good for no. John Dorsey to do if Jimmy says, hey, man, i got to know. you got to tell me. Give him the wrong name and see if that wrong name is leaked out there. <laughs> hey, Jimmy, Jimmy, this is why. This is why. I, 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 Jimmy, now you got to let me do my job and you do your job. You know? this, that would be a very interesting play by John Dorsey. We're going to go with... Uh... <laughs> Calvin Ridley, receiver of Alabama with the number one pick. Don't tell anybody we're going to shock the world. <laughs> Sources! Calvin Ridley skyrocketing <laughs> up the board. If, he, if, exactly if, John Dor- if John Dorsey does that, he might not be the person making the picks on Friday night. <laughs> That's probably also true. <laughs> but it would be one of the greatest troll jobs of all time. Yeah, no right? doubt. No doubt. That would be fantastic. All right, as we said, Darren Woodson is here with us. ESPN analyst, three-time Super Bowl champ, five-time Pro Bowler, the leading tackler in Dallas Cowboy history and a member of the Cowboys Ring of Honor. Um, first and foremost, the Des Bryant situation. We haven't yeah. talked much about that with you. Uh, the thing that shocked me about that was that there was no discussion of a contract renegotiation. Yeah. It was pretty clear by the time they got together, the Cowboys were moving on. Was that the thing that surprised you most? Absolutely. That there wasn't a give and take? Exactly. That's what surprised me the most is knowing that there wasn't uh discussion over maybe taking a pay cut. Uh And Des showed up without an agent. I think he felt comfortable about the situation when he walked in the door, and there was no negotiation. The Cowboys had made this decision, and I, and it, and I, you know, listen, Jerry Jones is the guy who's going to have the final say, but Stephen Jones has set precedence throughout this whole talk about the Des Bryant situation, mm-hmm. he, and he's basically been the guy that's been strong arming this this entire situation. I think Stephen Jones and the Cowboys all together understood: look, if the production is not there, are we willing to deal with? Des being late for meetings, Des not doing having treatment. Uh, are they willing to deal with well, off the field on. issues? How much of that was an issue? I think it all. I think it all played into itself because you know the numbers weren't there anymore. That they felt like you know he didn't deserve the the the, 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 the big contract. But I think it, that played into it as well. It's just you know sometimes you can forgive the warts, the guy showing up late, the guy not getting treatment. You can forgive those warts because on Sundays he's making big play after big play, and you say okay, well. Yeah, he didn't do this, but hey, big on Sunday he's he's making these big plays for us. I think that it just offset itself. Now, now it's like on both sides. Are you willing to deal with the warts and the lack of production? And they were not willing to deal with either one. And I think that's where the decision came in to say, hey, look, let's just part ways all together. No, no, you know, we're not cutting the salary. He's going to go out. He's going to. We were just going to release him. He's back out on the market. I think that's where the Cowboys were. And I think they. I think that's a Jerry. I think that's a Stephen Jones decision. That came down to hand. Yeah, and to me, I think it's more to do with the chemistry and culture part of it behind the scenes rather yeah. than just the production. Because from a production standpoint, if the guy is not giving you a certain level that matches the pay scale, then you go back to the negotiating table and you exactly. figure things out. But the fact that there was no restructure, there was no conversations around that, lets me know that there were some coaches and maybe some players, and that, players don't exactly. want, that don't want him in the building. So spinning this whole thing forward with Des Bryant – and knowing the way that he left, saying that he's going to see them twice a year, do you think that there's a likely landing spot for him in the NFC East? You know what? Look, I think that's the, what he I, wants. I, I, yeah, yeah exactly. Clear. I think he, that's what he wants. But Des is a businessman as well, and I, I think the business has to be right for Des. Listen, I, I'm a firm believer in Des Bryant that he still has something left in the tank. That he has at least two to three years left that where he can he can show you that he's a, a dominant receiver. I still think the business needs to be right for him. You just don't make a decision to go with the with the, the New York Giants or whomever it is in the NFC East and then take less money. That's that's a bad business decision. And if Jerry Jones has taught him anything, <laughs> it's to make good business decisions. So if if there's a team that's out there, if it's a Green Bay Packers team who's willing to offer him more money with a great quarterback at the great quarterback position, if it's the New Orleans Saints with Drew Brees, I, I think he has to look at the best fit. For him, that makes financial sense for him. It can't be, well, Odell Beckham's on the other side. I'm going to be over there, and I want to get back to the Cowboys. That's not a good business decision. Darren Woodson with us, our ESPN NFL analyst, of course, longtime Dallas Cowboys. So the question then becomes, you know him better than most. He's not the guy that he was in 2014 when he had 16 touchdown catches. Who is he at this point in his career? What is Des Bryant? I I think Des Bryant is a guy that, you know, looks, are we looking at the explosiveness that he's had in the past? And I I think there's a lot to be that plays into this. And I'm not making excuses for Des. 
but he's had a couple of injuries. Yeah, that that never got that that's that just never a fact. healed, and yeah. he never took care of those injuries. Okay, uh, and then he tried to go out there and play through those injuries, and that didn't work out. He went through a quarterback situation where Romo, who was his guy, who could put the ball exactly where he wanted to put it, had his injuries and had to, he dealt with that the lack of quarterback play at the same time. And then Dak Prescott comes in, young quarterback. They changed the whole outlook of this offense. They want to run the football. And through that process, he became a team player. You didn't hear Dez arguing about, you know, not getting balls. He saw the team was transforming into a run first, pass second football team, and he bought into it. The numbers weren't there last year and last couple of years. And I get it. I mean, I, I get that part of it. But for us to sit here and say, well, his, his talent and production are down. Yeah, that's one thing, but he, his skill set is all has, has fallen off. I don't know if his skill set has fallen that much. To think that he can't play this game at a high level. If he fight, if he goes to the right quarterback, the right offensive scheme, you'll still see some of that production. I'm not saying you're going to see that production that he had three, four years ago, right. but I think you'll see more than 60-some catches. You'll see that 70, 80 catch range. Now, Darren, the question becomes, how did the Cowboys replace the production from Des Bryant, or more importantly, what he means to that offense? Because yeah. to me, it's all about trying to get Dak Prescott back on track. You have the most valuable commodity Correct. in the NFL, which is a starting quarterback on a rookie contract. So Dallas has got to get Dak back on track. Yeah. He regressed in his second year. How are they going to do that without Des Bryant? Now, listen, they got to get back to the running game. What's made this team special is their identity, uh, and that's the running game. That's getting behind that big offensive line, establishing the, the the line of scrimmage, and then getting into the third and twos and the third and fours. And and I think that's where you see the best of Dak Prescott, the option routes with Cole Beasley, outside the slants to Terrence Williams. You'll see you know, Jason Witten being a bigger part of the game. That's the Dak-friendly offense that they want to see. Run the ball first, get it in third and short, and let him convert there with it, either in the passing game or with his legs. That's the Dak Prescott situation. They have, I, in my opinion, they have to get better as far as taking those shots when those shots are there. And I think that's where that hurt them the most last year. They did a good job with the option routes, but when it came to it, throwing the ball deep down the field and making the big splash plays, they are very inconsistent, and I think that leads to Dak Prescott. He needs to get better at it. Well, they could certainly use a burner on the outside. Absolutely. They don't have a, a speed yep. burner at wide receiver. All right, Darren Woodson with us here. And we This is the most important question of the morning. Chris Canty was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in 2005, second yep. round. Uh, had some fine seasons with the Cowboys, but had Super Bowl success with the Giants. And in a classic trolling job, the Giants are asking Chris Canty to be in Dallas next week uh, to announce the third round pick at oh, AT&T really? Stadium. Oh, really? So the question wow. is, 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 is oh. Chris going to get booed as He's a giant? He's getting booed. Come on, getting booed? come on, Darren. Yeah. You are getting booed. The Cowboy- getting booed. Did the Cowboys ask you to come out? No, they didn't. They have ask, not asked you to they, come out. They didn't ask yet. me to come out. You know what, man? This is a setup, Chris. Don't do it, man. I, I, I got to do it. I, do I it. have to do it. Don't. Listen, I, I didn't leave Dallas because I wanted to. Like you said, I'm a businessman. And I'm literally a business man. man. So yeah. I had to go to New York and get that contract. It just I, so I, happens I, that I won a Super Bowl as well. Exactly. Don't blame I, I, me for I'm, leaving. I'm not, I'm not blaming you for fault. leaving. I'm just saying when you show up, and you show up and you introduce that third, was a third round pick? Third round that pick. Third round pick, bro. Friday night. The boos are going, I'll be the first one right there too. Boo! Boo you, Chris. Yeah. I'm right in the front. Matter of fact, I'm wow. calling the boys up. Wow. Yeah, you, you I'm calling the boys up. Yeah, so, I'm calling my guys. Well, well, you know what I'm going to do, right? You know I'm going to wave at the crowd with my Super Bowl <laughs> ring on, on that oh, head just oh, to make sure everybody oh, understands what saying? I left Dallas for. Got paid, I'm, and we got some bling. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Done. Got a ring and the money to pay for the bling. There's there you no go, question lady. about it. There Listen, you go. he's got to go full Drew Pearson like Drew did. Oh, you do. You do. You to go all in. You got to go all in. The AT&T Stadium where the Giants have a winning record with Eli Manning. <laughs> he won his first three attempts in this building. You got to go all in. Gotta Embrace it. it. You got to be Joel Embreed. Embrace the villain. Embrace the villain. Embrace the villain. What are you the best, my man? Yeah, I slept good. My man. Darren was. He said I slept good. good. I slept good. Ain't no that question. Get out of here. <laughs> Hey everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for the Golick Wingo podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. 
Winning at sports and at sports broadcasting means changing things up. Just like La Quinta Inns and Suites is changing up their look. A renovated lobby that's so contemporary it even makes Golic look cool. Yes, it does. And a totally updated fitness center that even has Wingo feeling like a workout. I'm ripped. Plus, plenty of comfortable spaces to hang out. Yeah, this La Quinta look definitely has a vibe of victory. So you can just relax, refresh, and get ready for your next big meeting. Prepare to win at business with La Quinta Inns and Suites. Book now at LQ.com. Golden Wingo with you on a Friday morning, the home stretch on ESPN Radio and ESPN News, presented by Progressive Insurance. All phone guests join us on the Shell Penzoil performance line. And before we get to our next guest, who's one of my favorite people of all time at ESPN, I just have to call out what a, what a flip flopper cliff our board op is. Okay. He was the one when Jay Wright won at Villanova. He said, he said on air, man, we should replace uh, Brett Brown in Philadelphia with Jay Wright because he knows how to win championships. Wow. This is when they were winning 14, 15 games in a row. Yeah. And then a little imp bump that we just played that you had the distinct, uh, Northeast tones of Brett Brown. And Cliff gets in here and goes, that's my coach. Dude. A little like, bit of a fraud right there, Cliff. I gotta call ago, you out on that one. Five days ago, you were hurling sharp knives in his back. And now that's my coach. That's my guy. Come on. You know what's crazy? After game two, I almost fired Brett Brown again. There you go. See? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Cliff? Come on, Cliff. Be Come on. Committed. Be committed. Brett Brown, coach of the year now. There you, there you exactly, go. Exactly, exactly. He's waving the pom-pom for Brett Brown now. Unbelievable. Cliff, for crying out loud! That's Stu Gatz with us. Understand what's going on here. You know who it was? Who would never waver like that? Who that? is committed to the cause? When this person finds something that they believe in, they stick to it. That would be our next guest, Carol Lawson, ESPN basketball analyst. She's calling the Raptors uh, Wizards game. Three tonight, then Thunder at Jazz on ESPN tomorrow, then back to D.C. for the Raptors and Wizards Sunday. In other words, she's busy. She's also good. Uh, Kara, thanks for being with us. First and foremost, you got to kill Cliff with us, right? What's he doing? What's he doing? Yeah, I think um, I think Philly needs to have a vote whether they're going to have, uh, have Cliff in the, uh, in the fan, in the fan uh, team anymore because that's, uh, that's not something you can do. By, by the way, this is amazing. Uh, are you doing this in a wind tunnel? Because I love your commitment. I said you're committed. You apparently are going through a hurricane as you're joining us on the radio. I am. I am going through a hurricane. It's quite windy here, but uh, I'm committed to the cause to join you guys. See, that's that's Kara. That's what we need. That's who she is. Okay, what did you make of Joel Embiid last night and the performance that he put together? It just seems like right now... Uh, no matter if it's not supposed to be their time, it's, it feels like the Sixers are embracing this moment, and maybe they're just young enough that they don't know they're not supposed to be doing this. Well, listen, Joel has, has had – that's the kind of season he's had. I mean, the performance he had last night is consistent with what he's done all year. He's been a dominant force, one of the most dominant forces in the NBA all year long. Um, he's, he's one of the most difficult guys to game plan for. So what he did last night didn't surprise me in the sense that that's where his skill level is right now. Um, but when, when you talk about him sitting out the amount of time that he did and coming back and, and still having such a great impact in the game, um, you know, that's that's certainly something that uh, that not a lot of guys could do. So Philly looks incredible. I mean, they, they definitely have their works like any other team in the league, but uh, when they're all playing well and they have all their guys healthy, um, they're, they're a really difficult team to beat. Kara, based on what you saw last night from the Philadelphia 76ers, is this team talented enough to be able to make it to the Eastern Conference Finals? Yeah, I mean, I think they're talented enough, Chris, to make it to the NBA Finals, if we're talking Ooh. about talent, right? When you look at what they have on their roster. I mean, you start with Embiid, you have Simmons, what they did fortifying their bench with Ilya Sova and Bellinelli, uh, you know, after they were bought out by the Hawks. This is a team that's talented enough to make the Finals, yes. We could say that about probably – three of the East teams, I would say, in in Cleveland and Toronto and Philly. Those would be the three teams you would think the Eastern Conference finalists um, would come from. But, yeah, they're talented enough. Now, who knows how they're going to react in a situation where, you know, they're down in a series or they're playing on the road or you you face some of the adversity that all teams face through the course of a long playoff run. We don't have that experiential wisdom to know how Simmons and Embiid are going to react. In those in those situations, we we don't know that yet, so it's hard to it's hard to project. But from a talent standpoint, these these guys are as good as any team in the East. 
Well, look, nobody knows talent like Carol Lawson because real recognizes real. Carol Lawson, an ESPN basketball analyst for us, WNBA champion, Olympic gold medalist, went to Tennessee. She does uh, the Wizards uh, color commentary uh, on local TV and also does great stuff for us and became a meme in the championship game uh, <laughs> because of the, the heroics by Notre Dame over the weekend with the stoic Carol Lawson face. <laughs> Everything was going on around her. I am focused on the job. I am focused on the job. I am focused on the job. So let's focus in on, on LeBron James tonight. Look, he's been phenomenal in the first two games, Kara. But somebody else besides Cleveland has got to step up if they're going to get past Indiana, let alone get to the to the conference finals here. I mean, it has been LeBron James and others kind of in the first two playoff games, like it was in 2007 when he carried a bunch of no names uh, to the NBA champ, the NBA finals that year where they lost. But there are guys there that have got to step up. I mean, they have he's contributing either buckets or assists on 60 plus percent of their of their points. That can't sustain itself. Who can step up for them tonight? Uh, the number one guy you would expect to step up would be Kevin Love, right? I mean, because he's the guy that you've seen have performances, ha- have terrific performances before. Uh, kind of like we talked about with the Philly guys, some of these guys are unknown. Uh, some of the guys in the trade, whether it's Rodney Hood or Larry Nance, obviously George Hill's had playoff experience, but I, I don't know that you can be saying, okay, we're, we're going to put everything or we're going to depend everything on guys maybe that haven't done it before. So I think you look to the to the players that have been within that locker room and um, you know, Kevin Love is a guy that, that I think is most equipped to step up in a situation and help carry a team for long stretches. Um, other than that, this is just a different Cleveland team, and we all know that. They don't have the guy like Kyrie Irving that can that you can give the ball to and that can carry you for a half or for a game. They don't have that anymore. So the lion's share of this is going to fall on LeBron. I don't think that's going to change. For them to continue to win, he's going to have to – to take um, on the, the, the gargantuan task of carrying a team that he's done all year long. I mean, guys, this is something he's done all year. I mean, he's done this all year. They, they've had guys in now the lineup. Ty Lue was, was out. I mean, he's done this the entire season. And, you know, I, I just don't know that there's a recipe with, with the current roster for, for one person to do it, um, game in and game out. But the player most equipped would be Kevin Love. Carol, going out west, looking at that OKC Utah Jazz series, OKC's big three went 0 for 14 in the fourth quarter of game two. Were you a little bit surprised by that? And what do you make of what this group will look like in game three? Yeah, I think this is, this could end up being the, the best first round series, guys, of, of, of the, of the NBA playoffs when you look at the Thunder in Utah. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, I obviously watched the game and, and went back and watched the tape and, you know, a lot of those looks were good looks. I mean, they, they, they just didn't go down. Um, I, I was a little surprised, yeah, that, they, that those three guys went scoreless, particularly Westbrook and, and, and George, because of how well, um, you know, they played in that series. And when those two guys are going, it really doesn't matter what you do defensively. Um, they're they're going to find ways to score. Um, but, but Utah is, is, uh, is very good on the defensive end. And Donovan Mitchell's been been terrific. Um, you know, he he's really stepped up and, and been uh, the team the team leader in terms of the offensive end of scoring the ball. And um, he he's gone right back at Oklahoma City and, and has shown a great deal of, of fearlessness. So um, I, I'm excited. I think Game Three is going to be incredible. Uh, the crowd out in Utah is is great, just like it is in OKC. And and uh, I, like I said, I think this has a chance to be the best series of the first round. Well, it's been a lot of fun. And again, you're calling that game tonight with Ryan Rucco or tomorrow night, and your sideline reporter will be none other than Adam Schefter. So for people that don't know, the <laughs> people that don't know, Kara Lawson's nickname when she was growing up was a little bit. Okay. Really? okay. Yeah. A little bit. And now she's got feisty little nugget. Fe- Adam Schechter. <laughs> so we got a little bit thrown to feisty little nugget, which could make for some really good fun. But since we've got you on the phone and you're doing that game, real quickly, who's the rookie of the year? Ben Simmons or Donovan Mitchell? Ben Simmons. Yeah. Not and, even and question. I, and- for me, it's not, okay. um, but that doesn't mean it's not that close. That might be the first wrong thing you've ever said, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't mean it's not close. I mean, I think Donovan's had a fantastic year, but to me, it's, it's Ben Simmons. All right, so then the M- the MVP question, Harden or LeBron? Harden. Wow, 0 for 2, Kara. I'm shocked. <laughs> <laughs> Why Harden? Who am I being judged against? You? Me! Me! <laughs> Look, here's my argument. You ready? James yes, Harden went 2 for 18 in a playoff game, and Houston still won by 20. If LeBron goes yes. 2 for 18, they'll lose by 47. It's, it's a regular season award. I understand so that. What, what he does I understand that. But, but, but what I'm saying is it's showing the value each one has to its team. So we're talking about if you take, if you take James Harden away from Houston, are they still a playoff team? Yeah, they're still a playoff okay, team. Okay, if you take... Cleveland, uh, LeBron away from Cleveland, do they win 25 games? 
No, they don't, but you're penalizing James Harden for having a good roster? That doesn't that's not James Harden's fault that he's that he has a better roster. Value. Why is that his fault? Why should he be penalized? Value, it matters. <laughs> All right, that you I, I will I will give it to you because you clearly know more about this. And we do this every time we have Kara on the show. Yeah. She's not just a yeah. basketball person. She knows everything about sports. She doesn't know I'm asking these questions. I'm gonna fire them away anyway. Who do you think will be the first quarterback taken in the draft uh, next Thursday? Oh, first quarterback taken. Probably Darnold. Yeah. Okay. Who should be the first quarterback taken? Well, I don't know if he should be the first quarterback taken, but my favorite quarterback in this class is Baker Mayfield. But I don't know if he should be. I, I could, if you like Darnold over him, I, I'm okay with that. Okay. Who's the? But I like Baker Mayfield. Who's the best player in this draft taking the quarterbacks out? Saquon of it? Barkley. That's right. easy. All right. There you go. Uh, who's Who's the leading favorite? Do you think to win the U.S. Open at uh, at Shinnecock? Oh. I mean, I went with Rory at the Masters. I'd probably stay with Rory or Speed. All right. See, listen, she knows stuff, man. I, I not even you. not even a moment's hesitation. She's on top of it. You want to feel good about yourself, then you talk to Carol Lawson about sports, and you're like, damn it. <laughs> All right, Law Dog. <laughs> we appreciate you. We're looking forward to Saturday night. Little bit and feisty little nugget working together. Appreciate you as always, Kara. All right, thanks, guys. I braved the wind tunnel for you. So. Yeah, I, I know. She, she we appreciate that. This is yeah. what Kara does. She just changed the weather. So get on that and add 20 <laughs> degrees to the East Coast, please, and you'd be a hero, okay? You would be more of a Joel Embiid force than anything else. Just get All on right, that All right, I'll work us. on that. I'll get to work on that. Thank you. Carol Lawson with us. We'll see what happens. As she, Ryan Rucco, and the feisty little nugget, Adam Schefter. Uh, get us uh, with uh, the game Saturday night in Utah. It should be a lot of fun. Coming up. Baker Mayfield thinks he's going to be a top five pick. We'll see if Chris Canty agrees. Golik and Wingo, ESPN Radio, ESPN News. Decking, railing, lighting, furniture, fencing, framing. At Trex, we make the most in outdoor living because you deserve to get more from your life outdoors. So why not start bringing your ideas to life now with the brand that's engineering what's next? To learn more about all of the outdoor solutions Trex has to offer, or to find a local retailer or a certified Trex Pro deck builder near you, visit Trex.com. That's T-R-E-X dot com. Golik and Wingo reminding you, Golik and Wingo on the road, presented by Progressive Insurance, will be live next Thursday and Friday from Arlington, Texas, for the NFL Draft. Cars, homes, boats, motorcycles, RVs, and more at Progressive.com. Tonight on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app, and ESPN, rather, Game 3, Cleveland Cavaliers at Indiana Pacers. Our coverage begins at 6.30 Eastern. See what happens in the first game in Indiana. And Forward Thinking is brought to you by Cintas, a trusted partner of business everywhere. Cintas, ready for the workday. So odds are very strong that by this time next week, as Chris Canny is in for Mike Golick today, that we know where Baker Mayfield has been drafted. Baker, according to that Monday Morning Quarterback SI.com article, put a line at number five with Denver and says, I'm not going any later than that. We have both have said we maybe have some of our concerns yeah. about Baker Mayfield. Um, not that he can't be a good quarterback, but there are some things that are a little troubling leading up to the draft. It has nothing to do with planting a flag or not shaking hands. It's other stuff uh, that sort of caught our eye in this. So the question then becomes, where do you think he should go? Do you think that he will get past number five? Uh, yeah, I think he'll get past number five. And if you hear what John Elway is talking about, he's open for business. He's willing to trade down. Doesn't sound like he's in the quarterback market. Whatever teams that are looking to trade up could potentially move up there with one of those quarterbacks in mind. If Baker Mayfield is, is, is still on the board and we believe he will be, I don't know that teams are going to move up into the top five to draft him. I think it's more about the big three when you're talking about getting into the top five, that being Josh Allen, Josh Rosen and Sam Donald. So, I think Baker Mayfield will go somewhere in that, you know, that range of six to say twelve, because so there are some teams in that six to ten range. When you start looking at the Colts, the Tampa Bay Bucks, the Chicago Bears, the Forty ers the Raiders, they all have their quarterbacks. So there could be one of those teams that are in the 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 teens that are looking to move up. You're talking about the Arizona Cardinals, and then you look at where the Miami Dolphins are at at eleven, the Buffalo Bills at twelve, potentially jumping in there to try to get. Baker Mayfield. By the way, I'm assuming that uh, Baker will use this all as fuel for his fire because that's what he does. When someone said Oklahoma was pretender, he carried a pretender sign. I think it was Lee Corso mm-hmm. uh, on game day. He carried a pretender sign into a game. Uh, when he went back to Texas Tech, somebody called him a traitor, so he wore a traitor shirt because he was a, a walk on at Texas Tech, walk on at Oklahoma. Look, I get all, I love that part about Baker. Twice people have told him you're not good enough, and he's went out and proven it, went on to win the Heisman Trophy. I get all of that, and that works in college. 
I'm not sure any of that works at the next level. No, it doesn't work at the next level. And I think it's one of those things that have rubbed some talent evaluators the wrong way in the pre-draft process. Baker Mayfield has been seen as one of these guys that hears all the noise around him. And when you're a quarterback and you're you going to be drafted that. in the first round, you can't do those types of things. There's going to be criticism that comes along with it. You're going to fail, but that's a part of the learning process. You've got to take those things in stride. You can't react to everything that you're hearing. And that's one of the things that would concern me if I'm thinking about making a significant investment in Baker Mayfield. He already has some things working against him when you think about his stature. His not a lot of, issues. not yeah. a lot of quarterbacks that are his size have had success in the NFL. It's hard to be able to win from the pocket when you, when you have a hard time seeing past the line of scrimmage. He's only six feet tall. So that's one of the things that worries me. I, I don't see a lot of quarterbacks with his stature and skill set that have had success at this level. The only ones that come to mind are Russell Wilson and Drew Brees. And do you think that Baker Mayfield is in that ilk? Can, yeah. Is he capable of being that guy? Well, we know he's not as fast as Russell Wilson, so we can scratch that one. And Drew Brees may be one of the greatest quarterbacks in the history of football. I mean, five 5,000-yard passing seasons. There have been nine in the history of the NFL. So the reason why we're looking at this either first through five or, or in the teens is because the way this breaks down, uh, six through ten, again, the Colts are picking six. They are not taking a quarterback. The seventh is the Bucks. They're not taking a quarterback. Mitchell Trubisky went second overall last year to Chicago. They're not taking a quarterback. The San Francisco 49ers have made Jimmy Garoppolo the highest paid player in football. That's got to drive Pro- you nuts Pro- on some <laughs> level. They're not taking a quarterback. And Derek Carr is the guy in Oakland. So they're not taking a quarterback. And then the next two, 11 and 12, are Miami and Buffalo. So if it stays like this, if he gets past five, he's getting into the teens. The question then becomes, will one of those teams, 11 or 12, decide to jump one of the other to try and get into that top 10 and make that quarterback move? That's and it. That's, that's what it that's, comes that's down to. That's the wild card for him. So we'll see what happens. Again, the draft will start next Thursday. Golik and Wingo will be there. I'll be doing all three days of the draft. You will be calling the draft on ESPN Radio. And you, of course, will also be calling out the Giants' number 3 overall pick. You've, you've got to go full troll mode at this point I, in I, Dallas. I, I'm not going to go full troll mode Darren unless Woodson I get is going to be leading first. the booze for you. Darren just said 20 minutes ago he's going to be in front of the stage booing as loud so you can see him doing well, it. Well, if they boo me, I'll have something set up. Because if they yeah. want a villain, I can be the villain they embed. You, you can, yeah, there you go. He's not, he's not the villain you deserve, Dallas. He's the he's the villain you embed right now. He is Chris Candy. Chris, thanks for being with us. We got great games tonight in the NBA all over the ESPN family of networks. See you next week. I just saved hundreds of dollars by switching to Geico. I feel like a whole new person. Disclaimer, you will not become a whole new person. This is impossible. You might be able to join a gym or diet program, buy a new wardrobe, get hair implants, but your DNA and physical form will remain the same. Geico waives any and all liability if you attempt to become a new person, except a cyborg. If you choose to become a half-